there's a lot more demand for people who want to just improve themselves than anyone would have guessed. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Salman Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, and also the author of the new book, The One World Schoolhouse, Education Reimagined. Saul, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. In mid-2012 in the book, you mentioned that Khan Academy had about six million unique visitors to videos online. That were the kind of early genesis of the Khan Academy. Talk a little bit about what the videos are, and then what surprised you most about the enormous growth over the past couple of years in, in, in people watching these videos? The videos, if, when people look at it on you know, KhanAcademy.org, they will see um, someone writing, just the writing, on kind of a digital blackboard I created with screen capture. The biggest thing is when I made these things, I, I kind of assumed, okay, these are for my cousins. They, they were pretty motivated students. It, I kind of make them for, well, what would I have wanted when I was 12 years old or 13 or 18 years old? Uh, I said, well, maybe this will be just for the, the subset of people who are really you know, motivated, whatever that means, and, and they'll actually seek out knowledge on the internet, and then they'll find it useful. But it didn't take long to realize that a lot of the feedback we were getting were from people who are not the traditionally motivated, kids who were about to fail classes, kids that were thinking about dropping out, people who were going back to school. And they were saying, oh, this, the, 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 the intuition and the connections and kind of the very uh, conversational nature of these videos make me comfortable with math again. They make me understand the intuition, the big picture, and I'm trying to get excited about math. Right. So, so the big realization is, is the, and I think this is a surprise, frankly, everybody, is there's a lot more demand for people who want to just improve themselves than anyone would have guessed. In the book, you mentioned that New York State spends about $18,000 uh, per student. What's wrong with that? We're spending $18,000 a year for flat results over the past 40 years, basically, from public schools. People, millions of people watching your videos. What's wrong with the status quo? The problem is you can never say you're spending too much in education. It's such an important thing. You can never, if, if you can get a dollar of value in education, it's, right. it's worth it. Although that's not what's been happening. When you, exactly. I mean, when you look at the inflation adjusted per pupil spending, it's been going up and up and results exactly. are Exactly, and if you do yeah. back of, you know, at first when you look at the $18,000 number or in some, you know, even in the, the lower, the districts that spend less, it might be eight or $9,000. You multiply that by how many students are in a classroom, someplace between 20 and 30, uh, you get a fairly large number. You get something in between three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. And when you do that very simple back of the envelope calculation, you realize how little of that money is actually touching the student. It, very little of that is going to the teacher, very little of that is going directly for the facilities. Most of that is going to, for layers of administration. And the two things I point out are, one, uh, you, we can actually professionalize uh, treat teachers as the professionals they are, turn it into a career that pays as well as doctors. The money is there, there just has to be major restructuring in, in how you spend that money. The other big thing would is... Would that, by the way, is there any reason to believe that if we tripled what we pay teachers, we would have teachers that are 300% better? I don't know. I, I think, I think the, the general sense of any career, any profession, is you know, there's a lot of lip service being given to teachers. Oh, we need to respect you. We, uh, you know, we want we want the best of the best to, to be doing this. But un society is not sending that economic signal. Right. Uh, you know, I, I used to, you know, in engineering, I used to say, how come more people are going into finance than engineering? I was, well, you know, look at the salaries, right. and you get a very clear picture of why. Now that's actually changing in engineering. Yeah. Engineers can can do just as well or better than people in, in finance, and I think that has to happen so that one. We are already getting a lot of great talent in teaching, mm -hmm. but we'll get even more people who aspire to do this. And also it'll change the dynamic in the classroom, where the, the respect level, where the students say, wow, I wish I had a chance of becoming that person who I have the privilege to be with in this room. That completely changes the dynamic in the classroom. So I think that's possible. But I think the other dimension is, it shows that a lot of the excuses, if you will, on, you know, oh, we can't have technology, it's too expensive. Th those are round off error compared to the amount of money that's being spent, even on things like textbooks and whatever else. And so, uh, yeah, the back of the envelope is just really give people the big picture. You know, one of the things in the book uh, you, you really emphasize is that, you know, there are multiple ways and multiple sites of education. And I think some of the stuff that I found most interesting is just going back and rehearsing where modern, you know, the modern institution and structures of, uh, you know, K through 12 education come from, the Prussian model, things like that. Talk a bit about where the new sites, uh, like how we have to really start reimagining education so it's not something that happens eight and a half months a year in a brick building with you know, bad air conditioning. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, and that's what a lot of people don't realize. I mean, we all grew up in this education system. The education system actually looks fairly similar anywhere you go in the world. And so all of us have just assumed this is what an education is. This is what school is. And, and what I write a lot about in the book is, no, this is actually a 200-year-old artifact. It comes from the Prussians who, don't, they don't exist anymore, but they were kind of the cornerstone of Germany now, it is they said we want to have public education, which was a very egalitarian idea, but how do you do that in a scalable way, in a mass way? And they said, well, it's the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, how do we do anything at scale? And we, we kind of put things on these batches. In schools, it's age-based cohorts. We have a bell ringing every shift. You, they go at a set pace every station. You try to apply something to it. And at some point, you sift the product. This is the good product. This is the bad product. That's destined for the, you know, the supermarket. That, that orange is going to be juiced, right. <laughs> whatever else. And they did, they, it was the exact same thing with kids. And then when other nations, the US being in the middle 1800s, said, no, we want to do public education too. They said, well, the Prussians have gotten a model, and we're going to do the exact same thing. That's how we're going to scale. And then in 1892, few people realized you had this Prussian model already all over the country, but it wasn't standardized. In Massachusetts, it would be different than what's happening in Georgia. And so you had this committee of 10, uh, you know, I write a lot about it in the book, that literally sat down, headed by the, uh, the president of Harvard, that decided physics will be your last year of high school's chemistry the year before. You're going to do two to three years of foreign language. This is how good geometry, and it hasn't changed since 1892. Now, why, why do you think it is education is one of the last places that this kind of personalization and, and the revolt of the uh, kind of industrial revolution mindset of the idea of standardized parts and processes, why, why, is, it, why is it coming so late to education? It seems to be, you know, that, that's been blown apart in so many other parts of our lives. Yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully the whole sweep of history, it won't seem like it's come so late, uh, you know, a thousand yeah. years from now, like, oh, it just took yeah. five years after, you know, <laughs> the uh, travel or whatever, yeah. air tra the, um, I, I think it's been a couple of, you know, what I, I, almost everything I write about in the book has, there are ideas that have been around a long time, mastery-based, self-paced learning. There was examples of this being experimented with in the 1920s and in the 1970s, and, and they actually saw really good results. They were studied, and, and what made them very difficult to scale, I think, was two things, is one, everyone else was indoctrinated in something else and they just assumed that's what education was. And the other thing is to actually, in, in 1920 or in 1970, to do this type of thing where every student is learning at their own pace and mastering concepts, it was a huge effort on the part of the teacher to just coordinate, just coordinate. Hey, you're doing something different than they're doing. How do I keep track of it? They were, had to run around with worksheets and, and print out things and had to grade 30 times more things that they would have otherwise had to do. And so I think what's happened now is you've had uh, kind of a confluence of you have information technology, which has been around for 20 years, so you could say it's late, but 20 years isn't that long in the whole sweep of history, that can now coordinate information. And then that coupled with the idea that it's the, the barriers to consuming the information has gone to zero, pretty much yeah. zero, and the, the barriers to producing the information has gone close to zero. Before, if someone like me wanted to go out and make lessons for kids in schools, I would have to go pitch some publishing company, then we'd go through some process, pitch it to some top-down bureaucracy, and eventually maybe it might, and I'd have to argue with people. Right. Are you teaching it the right way? Are you not? Are you doing? And then what, what gets down to students will be this right. weird, watered-down thing. Uh, now you go straight to students, you can go straight to teachers, you can go straight to parents. And I think all of these things have come together uh, mm -hmm. to kind of create what's and, happening. You know, some of the ideas that you talk about, like flipping the, uh, flipping the school day, kind of. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because these are, these are not even things that would require any real change other than a change in attitude. Yeah, and I write a lot about this, and, and we've become somewhat associated with this notion of flipping a classroom. Yeah. And one thing I point out, it's not my idea, it's not right. Khan Academy's idea. And, 2007, 2008, teachers started emailing me, say, hey, you, you made some reasonable videos on completing the square or factoring polynomials. Um, I don't think the most valuable use of my time as a teacher, the, the teacher's time, is to give lectures anymore. Right. I can have students do that at their own time and pace. And then in class, we'll make it interactive. We'll do the problem solving. So what used to be homework is now in class. What used to be classwork is, is or lectures are now are now at home, and there's huge benefits. Now yeah, you're not and this it. is the idea that you know the teachers can help kids work through pro problems and and explain to the whole class, and then at later in the day when they're at home or whatever, then they can uh, soak in the lectures at their own pace. That's that's it, yeah. right. And 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 we're not you know what I advocate is that's one model which gets 
closer to the right idea, yeah. but then you can keep running with that. Right. You know, you don't have to say it has to happen at home or it has to happen right. in school. You can do problem solving wherever, but you should have some point in the day when humans do get together where they can help each other. And it gives the teacher real-time information on how are the kids doing. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then it allows you to go to the next level. Anytime you're lecturing, it has to be one pace fits all. Right. Now, if it's not lecturing, it's all the students. Now you can everyone learn at their own pace, learn at the stuff that matters, and you can start leveraging peer-to-peer. -peer. College and credentials. I mean, a lot of education, even at the K-12 through level, is kind of signaling to the next level of education that you've made the cut or you're the type of person who's going to go this far college even more so, what's the function of college and what happens to credentials down the line when we get into a more robust and uh, kind of uh, individualized, personalized educational experience? Yeah, I write le at length about it in the book, but it's a, you know, college is kind of a confusing, muddled concept, or even education is, where there's a learning part, there's a socialization part, and there's a credentialing part. And, you know, what I, I write a lot about is, you know, the students and parents, yeah, they, they appreciate the experiential, the socialization parts of college. But they are paying that significant amount, if you really ask them, for the credential. Right. You know, I joke, if you went to students graduating at Harvard, look, I'll refund all your tuition, you get all the experiences, you get all the friendships, you get all the learning, but you can never tell anyone that you went to Harvard University. Would they do it? I suspect most will not do it. In fact, most you would have to pay more than the tuition for them yeah. to have to take it back, uh, which tells you that they were paying for the credential. Uh, the, and, and the experience was kind of gravy on top of that. And the universities, think that they're fundamentally not, you know, the credential's nice, but the main thing they're giving is this experience. So that's a huge transaction, a huge part of someone's total lifetime income, where the person buying is buying something different than the person selling. And, and, and what I believe should happen, and what I believe is happening, is you're going to have a decoupling of the learning experience from the credential. So regardless of whether you went to Harvard or you went to the local community college, if you feel like you know something, you could go to a third party, well-established, rigorous assessment, better than what happens at any school, right. and prove that you know that thing. And you might have learned it on the job, at a community college, on Khan Academy, on edX, who knows what it might be. And, and you do that, um, I also think it clarifies it for the university. Right. You won't have the strange thing where kids are trying to make sure they get an A-plus in a philosophy class so that they can get an interview at Goldman Sachs or at McKinsey or, or Facebook. Uh, they'll be there to learn. And if they really care about the job, there, there's, there's another route that's somewhat orthogonal to the, to the first one. Change is coming to the educational establishment. I mean, the, the public school monopoly, the conventional public school monopoly is clearly breaking down. Charter schools are breaking out all over the place. People are opting out of the system. They're you know, doing homeschooling or whatever. Um, what are the main impediments to kind of increasing the pace of change? Are they, uh, and how much of those reside in the kind of, um, in, you know, the formal structures of, the, of, of school, uh, of the educational uh, powers, and how much are in the, uh, you know, are uh, shackles in the minds of students and parents? I think they're primarily in the mind. I think they are, there is, there are structural things. You know, I've talked to teachers, and administrators who believe everything I say, they believe it's the way, they look at other schools that are self-paced model, but they're like, no, but I got a state assessment test on this, and I got this calendar that the state has told me to do. And so they have to do this kind of in-between thing, this little dance where they kind of do lip service to the state, but they recognize that they, the kids have to learn at their own pace. So this is a weird transition state. Um, I, I've actually found very few people disagree with the principles. It's like, actually, this is common sense. This isn't like uh, really even under debate. Um, I actually take the opposite tack. There's, there's a lot of cynicism about, oh, change, and there's a lot of inertia and bureaucracy and all of that. I actually think it's, it's happening far faster than people realize, and in five or ten years, it's going to be completely mainstream. And for something as systemically as important as education, um, I think that's shockingly fast. The book is uh, The One World Schoolhouse, Education Reimagined. The author is Salman Khan, the founder of Khan Academy. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.